Welcome to Unscripted with Russo. I'm your host, Ashley Russo, president and executive producer of The Peak TV. For our podcast, we decided to explore the people behind the narratives. I'll introduce decision makers and influencers who are winners in their field and find out the intimate story behind their rise to success. All right, everybody, welcome to Unscripted with Russo. We are here with another amazing episode. We have Tony DeRay. He is from BSI Corporate Benefits, and he's a business leader in our area, and he's going to tell us a little bit about kind of how he became who he is today. So, Tony, welcome. Thanks for having me. All right, cheers. Cheers. Unscripted. We always have a little glass of wine, so here we are to kick it off today. All right, for people who don't know you, where are you from, and what's your family life like? So I'm from central uh, Pennsylvania, which is, uh, you know, they say Pennsylvania is uh, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and Alabama in between. (laughs) So in the Alabama region of Pennsylvania. So the Bloomsburg area is where I grew up. My family's born and raised here. My parents are high school sweethearts at Allentown Central Catholic. And then my dad played basketball at Bloomsburg University and taught there after school for 40 years. So. That's oh, that's how, that's how they ended up out in the Bloomsburg area. That's where I grew up, yeah. Okay, and that's where you grew up. And what about siblings, brothers, sisters? I have a younger brother, uh, Michael. Uh, he lives in Amsterdam. Uh, he has a decidedly more exciting job than me. He's the uh, international brand manager of Johnny Walker. Okay, wow, so. that is interesting. Yeah, he Does beats, that give you like wins. a discount? I mean, do you get any no, special? No, but I've had to, as his progression <clears throat> in his career has moved up uh, in the shelves of uh, alcohol, he's forced me to move up and taste with him. oh okay so, so he one, shames me for drinking brands that are not i got you. in the diageo so his portfolio. job is costing you a lot of money tons his, right his, his being on the earth has cost me a ton of money <laughs> uh you mentioned your parents you were saying that your father was a coach yeah was, coach okay co- basketball coach and teacher okay and yeah. what did he teach what subject so he's a social studies teacher so he taught the same class repetitively like six times a day but uh, he claims that Russian history was his one like oh. elective course that he he's a big Russian history buff so how he'd be happy that, to tell you anything yeah, I was gonna say Russian that's history. like really interesting and kind of specific why Russian history what does he say I, I I don't know the answer to that it was probably the one class that he was allowed to teach as an elective so instead of teaching the, the same, same ninth graders the yeah. same course over and over again somehow he he tracked there so uh, anything uh, Russian related. Uh, and certainly he'll talk forever on. <laughs> I love it. What about your mom? So my mom is how, how I got my health care uh, started. So my parents got married when they were 19 uh, when my dad was at Bloomsburg University and she went to work for Geisinger uh, Health System and then she proceeded to be for 45 years the executive assistant to consecutive CEOs at Geisinger Health Plan. So she, she worked for five or six extremely powerful individuals but stayed there her entire career. Interesting. And when you were a kid, what were you into? Like, what were some of your activities? Did you play sports? Did you play music? What were you uh, involved with? I have 16 cousins on my mom's side of the family. Every single one of them is musically inclined except me and my brother. Uh, okay. So we gave up all of our musical talents uh, to for the good of the larger family. Uh, my dad being an athlete, sports was an enormous part uh, of my upbringing. And what sports specifically did you play? So... High school, I played basketball, uh, baseball, football. My dad was a basketball coach and player, so he played for my father, which is his own interesting, you know, dynamic. Yeah, I mean, but what is that like playing for your dad? Uh, it, it you definitely grow together. Uh, it can be, you know, interesting at the time uh, for extra money when we were growing up because my dad was a teacher. He would uh, all through the summer run basketball camps, so my brother and I would go with him, you know, in the summer. So a ton of great memories there. Then coming up and playing for him, you know, it. it it never really was a something that turned out to be a negative situation, but it was it was certainly interesting to try to manage the way it was when he was my coach, and then you know we would come in the door. Um, some some good stories about that about that side of it. We used to have we had two TVs in our house, and when we come we would come home from a game, uh, we we would have the game film because my dad is the coach, so what he would say is. If you want to celebrate yourself, go downstairs and watch it with your mom. If you want to get better, sit upstairs and watch it with me. So those were the <laughs> those difference were in the options. two TVs. Yeah, so sure. those, those were our options. I love yeah. it. How often did you sit with him and how often did you sit with your mom? Depends on the game I had. <laughs> if I played really well, I would gravitate towards him because I knew there was less to talk about. You know? yeah. But if I needed, you know, everybody needs their mother. Right. So Bad game, went to mom. I love it. Yeah. And uh, and what were you interested in? Like, were you, were you academic? Were you into school? Was there a subject you liked? Were you kind of not into school? What was your deal? Academically, I was into the path of least resistance. 
Uh, I've always, you know, had a knack for looking for, uh, you know, to get to, to get to the best answer in the shortest amount of time. You know, so uh, I told my dad once that time was insignificant to me, uh, which he reminds me of that to this day. And now that if I don't necessarily like the timing of, you know, our employees or some things like that, uh, my dad constantly reminds me that uh, he had some struggles uh, that way. Uh, balance is a big word. Uh, for me, it was a big word for my parents. It's the B in BSI, uh, stands for balance. Uh, so I certainly carved out a balance between, uh, nobody ever accused me of not having fun in my life, uh, not in school, not in building the business. Uh, you know, I've, I've always carved out time for that, for sure. And you feel like that balance was sort of something that was taught to you by your parents or that they demonstrated? Uh, very much so, yeah. I think that they're very even keel uh, human beings, you know, so uh, there's, they, they, they were, great lesson teachers for me and my brother, uh, you know, that way, and have always celebrated life. Uh, my mother could find good traits in the most horrific individuals in the world. She's a, she's, she's a true saint that way. Uh, she's, they're both, they both are set a very high bar, uh, you know, my parents, and my brother and I joke about that sometime, which is impossibly high. Uh, for the way in which they live their lives, but they definitely set a great uh, a great tone for us. And you mentioned about having like a big family, and you come from you know you're Italian, you have mm -hmm. a big family. Tell me a little bit about that culturally and what that meant to your upbringing. You know, how does that? You know, it's familiar to me because I'm also Italian. But for people who aren't, they they don't sort of understand sometimes that how much of that is the fiber of who you are. So. What were holidays like? What, you know. Yeah, so holidays were down here in the valley. It was always a big trip for us because I, I remember <clears throat> coming from the Bloomsburg area. It's about an hour and a half, but in the Tamaqua area, we always remembered that there was this, on top of this bar, they had an entire uh, full-size horse set. And I remember when we got there, we were 15 minutes, then you'd hit the tunnel, and then it would be, you know, you'd be you in, in the close. valley. Yeah. My dad's family, uh, four generations, Bethlehem Steel, uh, east side of Allentown. And if you, you walked in that row house where we just moved my grandmother out a couple years ago into Phoebe, you, you, five people make it feel crowded. There was at least 40 people yeah. lying down a table in the center of this row house that, that I remember. And it was uh, like the, the best smells, the best, you know, the best memories, loud, always the uncle who just said all the most inappropriate things and you know, completely antiquated. So everybody played their part. And, and interesting focus because the focus wasn't really around, you know, you're in this tight space, right? So it wasn't really around, you know, the presentation so much as the, the, the being together. Yeah. I never saw my grandmother eat one thing ever because she never sat down. Uh, I, I you know, have that re memory. Um, she must have waited until everybody was, was done, but it was definitely her. It was her show. Yeah. It, it was her show. Uh, but yeah, it's certainly not about, uh, you know, the fine china and, you know, all of those things. It, it, was, it was about seeing a uh, large family on both my mom and dad's side, tons of cousins on both sides. And we would do the rounds, so we would go, uh, we would go eat what we consider the good food, which is at the Italian side of my family in Allentown, and then we completely overeat there because my mom's side of the family, she grew up in Emmaus, unbelievable human beings cannot cook. <laughs> So that was like all casseroles. So you knew where to start All first casseroles and, on yeah. the Emmaus side of the, the world. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of casseroles when there's like the, I yeah. hate when it's like a mayonnaise-y thing. Yeah, and it's developed yeah. over the years into, you know, they're, they're the kind of family that said, oh, no, this is just as good. Oh. So you, you, this, is, this tofu is just as good. What, no, it's, it's, it's really, really not. not. <laughs> it's not. So, I big understand. Food, big foodie. Like yeah. Well, that ha that, that's, a, that's a big Italian trait, right? We get really into our food. It's pretty serious. I'd say about 80% of my life lived in our kitchen in our house. Yeah. yeah. And can you cook? I love to cook. You love yeah. to cook. So that's good. So it's you, cathartic for Your me. parents had two boys. Yes. Your mother made sure, your father made sure. Who made sure you knew how to cook? Uh, both. They, they kind of split the duties, uh, which I'm amazed to this day. To this day, my parents still do not have a dishwasher. You know how to cook, and you were saying your mother was really into breakfast. That was important. Yeah, so my mom always started us off that way. You know, no matter what, she wanted us to make sure that you know, that we had a good start to our day, but it's carried with me to this day. Anytime I have a very important day, a big meeting, a new business, an opportunity, always eggs. Yeah. So uh, I told my wife the other day, I asked her, she started laughing at me if she would make cream of wheat, because I don't even think that she knows what that is, but I've I never had cream, cream of wheat. wheat since I was a kid. But my mom, I mean, I think it's because you know there's a ton funny? of sugar. Yeah, but it's funny about it, the cream of wheat is that that was something my Italian grandmother always made. 
Like that was like a breakfast. We had a lot. And yeah. this is something I ate as a child too. So I haven't heard anyone mention that for years. I don't know, but it's I, great. Do you have any? It's deli- I don't, but no. I love it. Right. I do love it. Goes yeah. good with I know. <laughs> it's yeah. great. You know, it's sort of like a polenta. I don't know, cream of wheat's like the. It is the polenta it's breakfast. It's the polenta of breakfast. <laughs> it's not bad. I know. You yeah. like that? Good. That's good. That's great. So, what happens after high school? What do you, what do you decide to do after so high school? So, I played college football. I went to Wilkes University. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, that was kind of interesting. And my dad was a basketball player, never played football in his life. And both me and my younger brother ended up being linebackers. Uh, we're more built for the sport of football than we are basketball. Uh, so uh, that was a passion of ours that we followed. So uh, played you know, played sports in, in college, played football in college. That was and, a, and why a Wilkes driver. when you were looking at schools? And did you know about Wilkes? So the, re- the reason I remember, one of the reasons I went to Wilkes was, uh, was certainly uh, the coach, Frank Sheptock, who's probably, you know, other than my father, the closest mentor um, that I still have, uh, you know, to this day. Uh, his, his daughter actually works for me. Uh, she was two years old. When I was a, oh my gosh. Uh, when I was a senior at Wilkes University, that'll make you feel old real every quick. Every day, yeah, every day. <laughs> uh, so big driver there, uh, and another great mentor of mine, great uh, human being. Uh, but what I remember also, uh, the Wilkesbury area, what I remember is it's it was at least one newspaper removed from my parents' house, meaning. Whatever I did in college, I figured that it would never show up on the front page <laughs> when my dad read the paper in the morning. That's funny. Because my dad always used to tell me, you know, if you don't want me, if you wouldn't want me to read about it on the front page of the paper, don't do it. Right, that which, is, which is what we now tell our kids. If you don't want it to end up on social media or billboard, don't put it. You know, that was, the, that was yeah. the version of that. That was the version of that when we that's were kids. Right. Yeah. It was the press enterprise, not Facebook. Yeah, well, that's yeah. interesting. So you were concerned enough about what, what you might do. <laughs> You yeah. wanted to be a newspaper. Away. Right. I wasn't, yeah, that, that was, that's always been more of my thought process, yeah. which is. And, and you played sports, and that was an important part of the college experience for you. But what about, did you have a sense of what you want to do in life? Did, did you know where you were going? Uh, I think uh, only as an entrepreneur, not, not specifically the industry that I've been in you know, my entire career, but I, uh, the entrepreneurial piece. Uh, I always appreciated spending my own money more than anybody else's. Uh, you know, I had jobs as far back as I could remember, uh, even playing sports, because uh, there was always something about having, you know, my own money. Uh, but the entrepreneurial piece, you know, when I was in school, that was probably the kinds of things that I was doing in school to get by. So I, I'll give you an example. So I figured out early on, like, I wasn't going to buy books for classes. Okay. Because I just couldn't get around how much of a ripoff it was, especially with the professors that write the book and then charge you for the book. They're that crazy. They They're make. crazily it's just, expensive. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. So what I would start doing is negotiating deals with other guys in the football team. So, you know, I knew that they took the class the semester before, so I'd buy them a case of beer if they'd give me, you know, their book. So I'm very proud to say that I never bought a book in college. That's so I amazing. always bartered for what I needed to. I borrowed notes. I did the things that I So you, know, you were sort of running do. a business on the side, not even realizing you were doing it. I, I mean, think it so. Just, yes, like, but your brain worked that way. It did. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and you know, procrastination is another stellar quality of mine. I think I learned that in, in college. But I think when you're going to the business world, the procrastination turns into you can't see around all corners, and things happen in a, in a business environment. And having that, you know, not getting knocked over, just being prepared for. All right, this is going to be a tough situation. How are we going to? How are we going to figure out, you know, how it's to get out of this? It sort of is an interesting perspective because I think uh, as an entrepreneur, you do have to be pretty agile. And so you can plan and you can prepare, right. but you have to really be able to react as things happen quickly. And, uh, and that idea that if you were a little bit of a procrastinator, you learn to react quickly because you had run out of time, right? Right. It's interesting. I never thought of that as a good connection, but it kind of is. That's how I would justify it. I like it. It's a good. I think it's a yeah, fair so justification. It, it, it makes sense uh, to me. It makes me feel better. <laughs> I like it. Tell me a little bit about your career. You you graduate college. What do you do first? So I work for Geisinger all through college. Use it as an internship. Also use it uh, to to make money. I work in their sales office in Wilkesbury. And when I was a junior, the vice president of Geisinger moved out to Ann Arbor, Michigan, to run the health plan that's owned by the University of Michigan. So because I already would worked for him, uh, it was by far my best offer out of uh, college. So I had the job before I graduated and packed up a car. I'd never been uh, anywhere to the Midwest or West before and uh, you know, drove out. I remember my mom was on the phone with the apartment complex 
uh, no cell phones, just coming, cell phones just coming about at that time. Yeah. But my mommy got me my first apartment. Nice. After Good I got mother. my job in Ann Arbor. Well, she that's broke a big risk. Deal. I mean, was there any part of you that hesitated or said, you know what, I'm, this is too far from home. I'm a Pennsylvania guy. Grew up in one small town, you know. Yeah, this is too no, much. but that would be very typical of my hometown. I had, yeah. I think, nine weddings in the first two years that I was out of school, and then none of them were college friends. They were all uh, people from where I mm -hmm. grew up. Very type of area that people tend to gravitate to yeah. stay or come back to. Uh, loved my parents. They were, I think we were all ready to be adults. So I graduated at 17. I was young. My birthday's in September. So. When I was in two a days at college, my freshman year, I was still 17 years old. I didn't turn 18 until uh, we start. I started school, so I was 21 when I graduated. But uh, and from 17 on, I never lived at home. You know, again, neither did my brother. So we certainly love our parents, but you know, we were you were already we were prepared to go. Yeah. I think our parents well, prepared them to go. What do you think? You know, when people talk about the kids are mm -hmm. they're, they're they're moving back home, or they're saying, of course, there's economics that come into play, right. certainly, but. What do you attribute that to? I mean, was that something that was self-driven? Was it because your parents said you could go out and do it? I mean, where did that come from? Well, I mean, we have, uh, we call it the M word. We don't say it. We have a lot of uh, the M words that work, uh, you know, for BSI. And uh, I think it's more socially acceptable now with the level of college debt. I think it's just become a thing where, you know, throughout your course of your 20s, it's just more acceptable to go back home and pay off debt. Uh, if I'm asked, I try not to force that on any of our people, but if they do ask for that opinion of mine, I would always say go. You know, you, you, uh, being poor when you're 23 or 24 means nothing. Everybody's poor. You know, there's no difference to that. The, the idea of, hey, I'm going to live at home with my parents at 24, 25, 26, 34, to save $500 in rent and get free meals, what have you missed out in life? Right. You know, I mean, but then again, you know, I, that's... That's me now. That's the way I would never have changed it. You know, yeah. I was I was ready to go. I just I you, never moved back home either. And I sort of think it's funny because a lot of young people, you know, here at ASR too, and and uh, and they're all pretty independent. And I think it's it's a good move. It's like you're starting your life. This is a whole chapter of your life that you don't explore if you're not on your own. If I would, if when I go home now, sometimes travel through Central Pennsylvania, and I'll stay at my parents' house for a night. I'm still in my parents' house. Right. So if I tell my mom I'm going to be there at, for dinner at 8 o'clock and I walk in the house at 11.15, my mom's going to be standing there with the same look that she, she, had. That right. she had when I was 15 and I blew yeah. curfew. I mean, to live, you know, in that environment just so you could have free meals. Yeah. I just don't get it. I mean, the, the freedom of, you know, that peace. But, you know, I do understand. I mean, times are different. College debt is... Crazy. You know, crazy. Um, it's more socially acceptable. Right. You know? I That's mean, I, I don't thing. know how well I would have done dating in, at 25 back in the day. People don't seem to have any problem with it. Yeah, now. that's so. interesting. So you pack up, you drive to Michigan. Drive to Mom Michigan. Mom gets your first apartment. She did. Makes she, did the she did well. Yeah. She overspent a little bit. <laughs> it was like a third of my take home pay. Yeah. Which is like Manhattan right. pricing. Okay. And so you're there. What 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 are you doing? What's the what's the daily existence? So I was a national account executive for a healthcare company. Pfizer was my largest client. Okay. Uh, I remember. So I was kind of, you know, had to, had to kind of pick up on some things pretty quickly uh, because most of the people that were in my job, I was 21, 22 at the time. Most of the people that were at my level were like 30, you know, 30 to, to 40 years old. So uh, I had to use, I had to use some street smarts. Uh, to fake it till I make it. You know? What do you attribute um, that to? Was it because you had worked for, for Geisinger? You had interned a lot? You'd had some experience? I had kind of proved it. The, the, you know, the individual that hired me was you know, running an organization, but he had kind of seen you know, me you know, excel. I was the captain of the football team. I managed to, you know, ironically, I made the dean's list four out of eight times in college. I only made the dean's list during football season. Which you would really? think, that's, a, that's more time, how did I do that, but I was focused. I was so, going to say, you probably couldn't procrastinate. A lot of <laughs> you stuff. You schedule. You, you know, you get into a lot well, of stuff. Well, they, they say that the busier people get more accomplished because they're sort of focused and they're busy, so. Yeah, so, yeah. but so I think he saw all of that, that piece, so, you know, he was willing to give me the opportunity and, you know, I kind of. And know, how long are you in Michigan? It. How long are you there? Ten years. Wow, okay, yeah. so you spent a long time there. I was there ten years. I was there, so it was, it was two years on the insurance carrier side when I was there, but realized that I didn't want to be, you know, I, I wanted, I was an entrepreneur, I wanted to own my own business, so I wanted to stay in the industry, but I wanted to represent companies, not insurance carriers. I got you. So, so. That's, that's the other side of, of the industry, which, you know, 
is where I am now. Right, and so tell us a little bit about BSI and, and what you do there, and, and where did the idea come from? So uh, I thought I was done with contact sports when I was done with college football. I was falling apart. I had all the knees and the shoulders and all those injuries, and uh, I started running when I got to Ann Arbor. Uh, so I lost all my college weight, my beer weight, my football weight, and I was bored out of my mind. So one of my buddies uh, back home said, you should find a local rugby team. You know, so I find a local rugby team in Ann Arbor. It's a very international town. There's a lot of international students that come to get their MBA. So international rugby, very big sport, great, great rugby players. So I'm there less than a year, and now I'm right back into one of the most violent sports you know, on so the earth. So it's like worse than football, isn't it? It's to some degree, some not, some yes, but uh, unbelievable sport, but also did, did a lot for me professionally. Mm. But I ended up meeting my business partner, uh, who's an attorney, uh, and when I got to a position where I knew that I was going to start my own business, I was considering either starting the company or going to work for uh, an agency like BSI. And it was really a question of money, you know. So I don't have any money. How am I going to, you know, seed money? How, what am I going to do to start up? I don't have any relationships with banks. I don't know how any of that works. And my my partner, my uh, business partner, is uh, very successful, but rugby player. That's a great thing about rugby. Lawyers, firefighters, ditch diggers, uh, politicians. They all play it. Yeah. You know, you can't BS your way on a rugby field. Right. It doesn't work. You can't do. You can't. That's use your the mouth. actual definition of a level playing field. Completely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, they call it a. Uh, it's a. It's a gentleman's game. It yeah. sorts itself out. So in football, twenty-two guys, six referees. Rugby, thirty guys, fifteen on fifteen, one. Really. Right. Okay. So it's a self-policing game. So if I'm going to do something to you that's against the rule, you're going to do a battle. I'm going to be revisited right. uh, in full in a short amount of time. So essentially, you know, I posed it to my to my uh, business partner when we were lifting one day, and he just looked at me. He said, "I got you." He said, "Take your shot." So in that moment, really, BSI was born because he basically said, "You know, whatever you need to do, just go be successful." So that's awesome. Yeah. You know, you are an entrepreneur, and you. <laughs> With that kind of comes a, a particular skill set. Tell me what your strengths are, and tell me what your weaknesses are, and how have you, how have you covered yourself for your weaknesses? Um, well, from a, I think one of my, one of my strongest strengths is staying in my lane. So I've always been very comfortable with what I'm not good at. Uh, I think that I see a lot of people get key. into trouble. Super key move. Yeah. Because they try to pretend as if they they know something that they do mm -hmm. not. Uh, I've always gravitated towards people that were better than me in everything that I, I did in sports. I always wanted to be with the people who were bigger, faster, taller, had better work ethic, uh, had better talent. Probably that comes from being raised by a coach, so not being intimidated by honest. Right. Uh, yeah, you probably feedback. had the, that that analysis when you did the TV with your dad. Probably had a lot of influence over this. A lot idea of life that, lessons, yeah. you know, with respect to you know it's. It, it, Criticism can be very difficult for a lot of people to hear, uh, especially you know the younger generations, because they didn't get a lot of it growing up. They yeah. got everybody gets a medal. Right. Uh, it's a little bit. Well, it's an interesting concept that you know not only were you striving for to be better, or, yeah. or you know, I don't say perfection necessarily, but always to be better. But in the process of doing that, especially in sports, especially with the coach father, you've got to really accept what you're not good at, right? Yeah. I mean, there's no way to get better if you don't say I need to get better and revisit it. And right. rewind and, and revisit it and yeah. rewind and revisit it until, you know, so, uh, and then college football is no different. It's just yep. the equipment gets better. They actually have uh, machines in college football where instead of like a stop rewind, if you can imagine the remote. They can just do it. It's right? a dial yeah, yeah. in every, every single step. So, you know, when, when I did something wrong on a football field, in my mind, I'd be praying that for some reason it was out of focus. Because I knew on film on Sunday we just stopped there for 20 minutes and just go back and forth. Uh, but that's it, pretty harsh self-analysis. But it's interesting to see how related that is to the way you looked at business and the way you looked at yourself. So, yeah. all right, so you stay and in your lane. And the competitive piece. That's a sure. big piece of it. I think if you're going to be an entrepreneur and you're going to start from scratch, you need to want to win. You need to outwork established companies. Uh, I remember one time uh, this doctor told me, you know, the world of business, it's like it's made up of a certain amount of pie. 
they're not making more pie. Meaning there are under industries obviously that have exploded that are brand new, but for the most part in my industry, we've had to take every single client that we have across the country from someone else that was more established, that had been around longer, that understood more about what they were doing. If you don't have the, uh, the will to prepare and the will to win, you know, that's, it's gonna be really difficult. So that competitive piece, mm -hmm. you know, that I've always had on the athletic perspective, uh, that really had propelled the firm. Yeah, you know, that's cool. Time. And when you started and you, and you had this, you know, your, your business partner, mm -hmm. lawyer, his name? Yes, Vince. Yeah, Vince. Yes. Um, and he says, do, what, what do you do? Like, what's the first step? How'd you start? So the, the, I think the great thing, I have two partners who are, they're both attorneys and they have a law firm. Right? Okay. So the, everything that they do from a business perspective, they do together. So I was part of that package deal. Vince decides that they're going to invest uh, in my company. David, my older partner, we're 10 years apart. You know? So at the time I was 24 uh, when I started the company, Vince was 34 and David was 44. Uh, but I think you, know, you hear that stat, 90% of businesses fail in the first year. And I think, looking back on it, I think the reason that I was able to make it through that first year or two is that because it wasn't really the money that they gave me to keep the lights on, uh, professional services firm, so you don't need dump trucks or things like that uh, yeah. to get off the ground. What they did was, here's your desk, here's your office space, here's your accountant, this lawyer will file your LLC paperwork. So when you're starting a business, things that you know nothing about, right. uh, they were able to just take care of that and <clears throat> just set me in a course to say, we don't really know what you do. Uh, but we're going to give you all the tools. We'll take care of the yeah, peripheral. Yeah. Just go do you know, what you want to do. I had a, a kind of a funny story. You know, I was trying to make ends meet. I had turned down a six-figure sales job to start from scratch. And I got offered, we was in Detroit at the time, and I got offered through Rugby Connections <clears throat> this opportunity to travel around at the auto shows all across the country uh, to do kind of like a, you know, you, you know the people that stand next to the cars yeah. and you know this uh, whatever at the auto shows. So I got offered to do that on the weekend. So I get to travel. I get to make a pretty decent amount of money. Uh, and I told my business partner Vince about it, and he said, I, "I have an idea for you. Why don't you go into the office on the weekend and figure out how you're going to make this company work?" I'm like, "Okay, that sounds like a maybe I'll go that maybe I'll go that way." Yeah. So. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, so they, really they got like everything giving, else out of the way for me. Yeah, just and giving you the lesson, thing. too, there that, you know, when you're building a business, it is not a Monday to Friday, 9 to 5 gig. It's like all the time. It's the other hours. Yeah. It's, like, it's, it's specifically it's actually the other it's hours. specifically yeah. the other hours. Mm -hmm. I also remember someone told me one time when I was starting a business, it's great being an entrepreneur because you can pick whatever 80 hours a week you want to work. But you got to work 80 hours a week. I know. I that's, mean, that's a good way to look at it. If sure you want is. to. If you want to, if and not every, it's just not for everybody, for mm -hmm. sure. Um, how has the business grown? Tell me how long you've been around and, and where you're at now. So we just cel we celebrated 15 years uh, in business. Uh, I was in, uh, it was in Michigan in total 10 years, but uh, it was about 10 years ago that we uh, moved back. My wife and I moved back when we st decided to start a family because all of our relatives are back here. We have great friends. Uh, in the Michigan area, but friends don't watch kids. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> especially when we had when one when we came back, like we have you. three now. We have grandparents that are all here in the valley. So, so that's this, great. Is, this is home. And certainly a gain for all of us in the valley. You, you know, you and BSI are really um, entrenched in the community. You do a lot, you give back. Why is that something that's always been part of your mission? Like, why, why give back? I mean, you could certainly a business, you can grow it, you make a lot of money, but you don't really stop giving back. Uh, BSI is a is a, a combination of my parents. So you've got two people who would give you the shirt off of their backs. Always did, I always witnessed that. Uh, that. That piece of it comes from them. So they would always look at me, my dad's a teacher, my mom you know, is an executive assistant, uh, and I always would do these things, entrepreneurially speaking, and they would look at me like, we don't know where you came from. You know? So where I came from that way is you know, BSI, you know, we kind of say, is a for-profit company with a non-profit heart. So the idea that I have this competitive nature uh, and I want to grow a very successful, profitable company and I want to win, uh, but I want to do it the right way. I want to do it with integrity. I want to do it straight up, meaning I'm an athlete. So I have this saying, game starts at 1 o'clock. And what that means is, you know, in business sometimes people sneak around and they try to avoid their competitors and go behind their backs. and. Uh, I look at it more like 
Meet me at a the rugby field. game. Yeah, the game starts the at one Let's o'clock, yeah. and if you knock me, you know, on my right, I'm going to either get up or I am not. You know, so yeah. I've approached building a business the same way. I think I, I love my competitors, you know, locally and other places. I think I think they prefer sometimes if I'd be a little less intense, uh, but I do love that competition piece of it. That comes from uh, my dad, that piece of it. But in general, from my parents, that nonprofit. Uh, want, want to give back allows me to, uh, that's probably what BSI has afforded me. Anything else is the ability to be able to, I think we're involved in about 35 different nonprofits. So, you know, I think that's the best thing that it's afforded to, to do, you know, for me, and that really comes from my parents. All right, Tony, before we wrap up, I do want to ask about your family. How'd you meet your wife and tell me about your three kids? So my wife, Adrian, uh, is interesting. Like, the, the joke is a, is an arranged marriage. Okay. Uh, so uh, our fathers are fraternity brothers that went to school at Bloomsburg University. Uh, there's pictures of us when we were very young, when they had reunions. You know, we were all at the same party. We weren't close to their family growing up because they lived down here in the valley. They lived in College Hill and Easton, and we lived about an hour and a half away. But we have pictures of reunions where they had fraternity uh, reunions where you know we're in pictures together when she's three and I'm five and so I got out of school moved to Michigan came back uh, to the East Coast to go to uh, the, the shore uh, on vacation and her family was down there as well uh, we met over the course of a couple of days and I had all those weddings I told you about yeah. that and I need a date <laughs> so we went to 11 weddings in two and a half years. She was a junior at Lehigh at the time, and we were wedding dates. We weren't a, we weren't a couple, yeah. we were just wedding dates. That's so amazing. when we got married, we didn't know anything about what we wanted. We just knew no, we had this you didn't, laundry list of all things, the things that we you did not want. want. Uh, That's great. Because we, we, we had all kinds of weddings. We had, you know, the 400 a plate, you know, swan type wedding, and then we were in a VFW drinking seven and seven, having a Gatorade cooler, plastic spoons, and we did a power hour instead of a happy hour. That's awesome. That's amazing. Better wedding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was, our, yeah, that, was, that was our start. So Adrian uh, moved out to Michigan after she graduated from Lehigh, uh, which was a fairly big yeah. uh, step. One of my closest friends, uh, who they were, ended up both husband and wife were in our wedding, lived in Toledo at the time. And the first time that she came out, my friend told her that she should never move out without a ring. I was like 23, 24 yeah. at the time, so you know I didn't appreciate that. Yeah, so much, that's but Adrian set, yeah, did it anyway. Did it anyway. Yeah, we lived there for about 10 years, and after we had our first Lila, uh, we started to make our transition because I had built a book of business back east. Uh, I was coming back and forth, uh, so so then we made our transition back. Uh, it was almost 10 years ago. And your three kids are Lila, uh, who's nine, almost 10. Adele is uh, seven, and then Leo is four. Awesome, great name. So. Uh, You've little known fact that if I had had a third yes. and it was a boy, his name would have been Leo. Very nice. My gra my husband's grandfather was a Leo. So that was that was on our very short list. All right. So yeah. Leonardo Michael is his, is his Leonardo Michael DeRay, and I only say that because that's what normally is being said around our house right yes. now. Oh, he's getting Leonardo that. Michael. Yeah. That's a big mouthful of good. That's like a good parenting disciplinary name. It's it's on <laughs> with, that, with, that, with that, and he's certainly. I love it. I'm going to ask you one more question before yeah. we wrap things up and we do a little rapid fire thing here at the okay. end. But what um, virtues and, and uh, traditions are happening in your home between you and Adrian with your three children now mm -hmm. that are reminiscent of your childhood, that you're trying to instill, that were important to you as a kid? I think the... The dinner table, uh, the kitchen. Uh, my wife loves to cook, as do I. We are the hosts. Uh, we bought a really old house on College Hill, so that has morphed into uh, go-to on Thanksgiving. We'll have two days of Christmas. Uh, a lot of, a lot of celebration of family. So. Our house is kind of like uh, Everybody Loves Raymond. Yeah. Have you ever seen that show? So Absolutely. Every time you walk in the door, it's always somebody. somebody. It's never just our, 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 our immediate family. There's always somebody between uh, my in-laws or my parents who are down quite a bit and, and uh, stay with us from time to time. But I think uh, the continuation of the celebration of family, my wife's Lebanese, uh, so their culture is really steeped uh, in tradition and family. So if you combine those two with an Italian family, uh, you, get, you get loud. 
Uh, you get a lot of fantastic food. I was just going to say the fantastic food's got to be unbelievable. Food. Yeah. Uh, my wife is kind of, the, the, she has three sisters, but she carries on the traditions of, she's the, the, the one that cooks everything from scratch. So, uh, you know, the hummus, the, the bulai. Uh, Are the you learning? Bread. And have you learned Lebanese cooking? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, number one rule in our house is that if one person eats garlic, Everybody, Everybody has, to. has to. You can't have one person have <laughs> no. anything Lebanese. You I have to do it. it across the board. Otherwise, you yeah. have to sleep yeah. in the garage. Yeah, exactly. So. Perfect. All right, Tony. Well, I want to ask you a few questions. You are not prepared for these. I did not tell you these in advance. Okay. All right. If you were not doing what you're doing now, what would you be doing? If I'm not doing right now, what would I be doing? Uh, a coach. Be a coach. I had a feeling you were going to say that, yeah. Mm. And do, are you involved at all with coaching with the kids, or is that something you're looking forward to possibly doing? Or I, I'm good on the sideline right now. You're good on the sideline? I had to tell yeah. you, I would not predict you were good on the sideline. I am not a I, – I, I prefer to try to sit back, especially with the way coaches are now with younger kids. Yeah, right? not, they, not add to the scene. More coaches now think that they're coaching because they're trying to get a scholarship for their child and live out there. Right. Their failed as athletic to all the, dreams the, as opposed to doing it yeah. for the good of the All the lessons the you just community. told us that you came out of sports. Right. Yeah, so okay. I'll, I have a lot of friends that are doing it, but I think I'll hold out as long as you I can. can. Yeah. It's yeah. nice to just be a spectator sometimes, just like cheer them on. And, yeah. I yeah. mean, happy to, to dig in and yeah. help. You sure. Know, but the, our rule with sports is no pushing them into anything. But if you join, you, you got to do it. You cannot quit. You got it. We're you the same to, way. You have to finish the same way. what you started. All right. What is one place that you have visited that you loved? Favorite place you've ever been? Uh, so rugby has been passion and traveling to, to see rugby. So my brother living in Amsterdam really opened up uh, Europe. But uh, so I give you two. I got to go to the, the Rugby World Cup, the international final, which is in London. Uh, three years ago, uh, which was a, a bucket list trip with my business partner, Vince, you know, who had introduced me to rugby, helped me start. So we cried like, you know, 10 year olds uh, when we sat in the stadium and chanted before the game was 80,000 people. That's amazing. Uh, was one of the most epic trips of my life. And the other one would be Scotland. We had 35, we called it the World Cup of Friends. So every four years we're gonna do it. We, we could, through my brother's company, Castle in Scotland, in uh, Speyside, which is where a lot of the best single malt scotches in the world are. So his company owns a castle of which we commandeered, uh, and we got to stay at a castle in Scotland. Uh, it was like that show my wife watches, uh, which the, the 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 British show. It's got the it's got the servants and Down it's got Abbey. the Down Abbey. Yeah. Right. So it looks like that. That's so, pretty incredible. What I like about your experience. answers, though, is they were less about the place and more about the people that were with you Always. on the experience. Yeah. Always. Um, what is one place that you have not been that you hope to get to? Place that I hope to get to that I have not been to. Yeah. I know. It's tough. Big world out there. Yeah. I sometimes think about climbing Mount Everest. Really? Wow. Did you watch the movie? I've seen them. <laughs> <laughs> That's I all I needed to do. As I I'll have you know that I have climbed eight Adirondack peaks when I was a kid. It's a little known fact about me. And that was good enough for me. Just saying, you might you're, want to tackle that good? first. I mean, it's, you know. So I can't go right there. I just would go to the Adirondacks. Do like a camping overnight, hike a mountain, and see how you feel. Well, I think my, my, my one, I see these people and I, they, you think you, know, you could do it. Well, so I, I jumped out of a plane a couple of times. Okay. I was like, terrified of that. So I just went and did it. Did it. Yeah. That was the best way to just, get over I that. I would just do a, just do a casual hike first. Up Mount Everest? <laughs> <laughs> Report back to me on how it goes. I'll let you know. We'll see. All right. If you could have one final meal, what would your final meal be? Final meal. Uh, final meal would be a sandwich. Of some of, what of some a yes. sandwich. So with it better be like a brajute something. No, no, no. What don't don't need fancy. So am I on death row or just I'm about to die? Oof, I guess you're about to die. It's okay. your final meal, but you have no restrictions. Your health does not restrict you from eating anything. So a either a, a, a brisket or a Reuben, maybe from Herschel's at the Reading Terminal Market in Philadelphia. Okay, something big and, okay. Chips in the sandwich, yep. old school, pressed down, because you can't teach that. Like, people don't understand that. I mean, 
what I want to do is make a chip the same size as a sandwich. So when that they do only, that, why doesn't why don't you do that? It's a perfect size as a sandwich, an and then the chip, and then you get the perfect the the crunch and the meat at the same time in the bite. All right. So I call it, it was like my. This was an unexpected answer. I'm going to tell you. I love it. Uh, I love it. I okay. could eat. <laughs> you said that like someone who isn't allowed to have like bread. You know, like it would be a sandwich. <laughs> You know, when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm off bread, like those moments where right. I'm not eating bread. So you thought I was going to get a charcuterie as my last? No, you know, I just like I a, thought maybe you were going like to say a, like, a, like a sauce or a pasta or, you know, a thing like that. And yeah, no. I mean. I like it. In my house, you got, you got Italian. Sweet, that's, that's gravy once a week. Yep. You got every Mediterranean fare that you could possibly. I yeah. Mean, There's a so. lot of good food in here. So you want the thing you can't get every day. I mean. I like that. That's a good answer. All right. Well. Tony DeRay, BSI. Up next, he's going to be making a chip, one chip that fits on a sandwich. So just stay tuned because I think that I think you're onto something. You're like here that. first. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening. Unscripted with Russo. Until next time.